All right, Bisk. Welcome to the podcast. Welcome back to the 307 podcast. Everybody, we got a special treat for you today. We got Miss Biscuit. She's probably the hardest guest on earth to book on the podcast. These are lies. Lies. We're not in the studio right now. Can you see me on that camera screen, boo? Am I in the camera? Barely, but yeah. I am? Uh Uh-huh. Okay. So, yeah, we're not in the studio right now. Um, There's a few people that I will move the podcasting equipment for, and Brooke's one of them. Thanks, baby. She likes to be nice and comfy in her lair. Well, we always end up doing our podcast in the evenings, too. So, yeah, I wouldn't want to be at the office, you know. But you you guys, you and Blake have pretty much kicked me off the podcast. We have, I told you, you have an open you invitation s- to the podcast. You said that today for the first time. Other than that, I think you guys know you can't filter me. And you know I'm going to argue with you and, and always tell you exactly how I feel. So most of your topics are pretty touchy, and you don't want to deal with me. You invited me one time, and you knew I had something to do. And you were like, babe, you should come on the podcast today. And I was like, yeah, that's a good idea. Well, from now on, you have an open invitation. Well, I'll take it. I know you'll be respectful, baby. I'm always respectful. I know. That's what I'm saying. What so what is this is a this is gonna be what the is this the third origins episode? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's the third. So if you guys don't know what the origins episode is, it's just kind of a project that Brooke and I started a while ago, months ago, where we're just kind of going through our lives since we met, anyways, mm-hmm. and talking through everything, yeah. pretty much, and yeah. that's all it is. And I'm I'm actually thinking about continuing this origin series because the interesting thing about these episodes is they're not really the the purpose of these episodes is not really to inspire anyone or like it's just basically our story. Yeah, and I think people like that, obviously. And I've thought about doing more episodes like that, origin episodes after hours, to where you have people on, mainly maybe older people. Like the guy I met at the spring the other day. Yeah. He was 95. His wife was 94. They've been married for 71 years. His name was Felton. Old school. I'm wondering how long you're going to talk about this before we can actually get started. Well, I was just... Telling the listeners, I, I like him, man. If you had that dude on and just allowed him just to tell his story, it's not like trying to interview him, but just kind of guide him through his story, you know? It'd be I, cool. I think. And that, so that's kind of the concept of the origin series. And I think it should be explained because we have a lot of people on here that are new listeners that probably weren't listening when we release the last origins episode yeah if you're listening to this and you don't know what those are you need to go back and they'll be labeled origin series yeah you need to listen to one and two and then come back to this episode yeah oh didn't you want to share some unique things about yourself or something myself you you said you wanted to start the episode off by sharing some uh you uh unknown things about each other Remember when you told me that in the kitchen? Don't remember that. Baby, you did too. You said you were going to tell people that I didn't like cold water. You didn't no, you don't like being wet. I don't like Oh yeah, okay. I don't like being wet even though I ran in the rain today. I didn't I don't like being wet, but I can deal with it. Mm-hmm. Um I forget what the other ones were. Well, I guess that went out the window then. Let me know when you're done so we can okay. get started. All right. Where where uh, where are we starting at? So we went over, well, we met when we were young. We dated for a little bit. You decided to be a Navy SEAL. We spent a whole episode talking about your Navy SEALness and how that went for you. And then we, I moved out to California to be with you after you finished BUDS and SQT. During SQT, you moved out. 
while I was in SQT. Yeah, that's what I said. Yeah. And then, yeah, and then we talked all the way through that till SQT. We went all the way through up through SQT graduation. SQT is SEAL qualification training. It's what you do after but BUDS. Baby. No. Uh-uh. And then... That that was it. So what do you what do you had to say? I was just recapping. I was just saying that when we left off, we had done that and then we had gone to we were moving we were leaving California and we were moving to Virginia and we were stopping in Georgia. And that's where we stopped. Tell me about that process. What do you mean? What what how did how was that? It was terrible. Any details on it? It was awful. I don't like your energy right now. I'm I'm asking. I'm you're, I, you're throwing me off. I'm trying to get the details on that. So, we packed up our two trucks and drove across country, and we just fought the whole time. I don't. What kind of trucks did we have? Irrelevant. Irrelevant detail. No, I had. I it's not irrelevant. We we were essentially kids. We had to drive from San Diego to Georgia. I had a I had some leave, right, built up because you didn't get any vacation during BUDS or SQT. So in the military, you get 30 days of vacation every year, and it just builds if you don't use it. So they allowed us to take some leave, which is vacation, in between the time I left the training command on the West Coast and the time I had to arrive at SEAL Team 8 in Virginia Beach. So our objective was to move from San Diego to Georgia where we were going to spend that. It was like three or four weeks Mm -hmm. of leave, and then we were going to go from there to Virginia Beach to the SEAL Team 8, which was my first SEAL team that I reported to. And we had a a old, well, a older Dodge diesel truck, four-wheel drive, that we bought from some Mexican in San Diego. Never buy a vehicle from a Mexican in Southern California. What what they what, what the what, crap? What what we figured out later was <laughs> I, don't th- don't listen to that. Comment, what these me- the what these Mexican guys I think were doing is they they're buying they would buy vehicles in California that had been wrecked or totaled. Mm-hmm. They take them down to probably into Tijuana, kind of ha- halfway fix them to where they cosmetically they looked fine. Then they'd bring them up and sell them for top dollar in California where people had money. So we had bought this diesel truck. It was actually a great truck, but we found out later it had been wrecked like really bad. Remember, it kept overheating too when we were On driving drive. through Texas. It kept overheating, and then we had an old S10 ZR2. I don't know if y'all remember the S10 ZR2 trucks. It was actually a nice truck. I had had that truck for a while. I bought it while I was in Great Lakes and actually drove it from Chicago out to San Diego and had it all the way through Buds and SQT. And Blake and Caitlin were supposed to drive the S10 or that's what they ended up driving most of the time. And me and you drove the Dodge. Because um, it was hard to separate you from that Dodge truck. I love that Dodge truck. I wish I could find another one like it that hadn't been wrecked. You were very possessive over that Dodge truck. It was a diesel with a Diablo chip. And it was a freaking six-speed, five-speed. It was a six-speed, right? Five, yeah, five. five or six. It was a straight shift. But it was just epic. Yeah. Like, it was freaking epic. It was an extended bed, four-door. The truck was bigger than anything on the road. I remember being at jump school out out uh, in uh, where, yep. wherever it was, and uh, you came out there. What were you driving? The S10. You must have been driving the S10. I was. You. We had got that. I had drove that new Dodge, new to us, Dodge, to jump school. And while I was in jump school doing my thing, you slipped in with the S10. Switched them. Took the Dodge so you could drive it for the day and left <laughs> me with the S10. I mean, you were you were all about that dang truck. I loved that truck. Yeah. I love that truck. What's funny is 
when we lived there, like all the places we went, like Pacific Beach and Del Mar and I forgot what the other one was. They all Mission, Mission Beach, I think. Mission Beach, yeah. yeah. They all had those little smart car parking spots. So like when I drove that thing, I couldn't go anywhere without breaking the law and getting a ticket, but I loved it. I didn't care. Yeah. So we we took everything that we had in that little one room apartment or the 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 apartment we were staying in, you heard from the last episode. Yep. We had one little room in there. Don't retell it. Everything that we owned, we took it and piled it into those two trucks. We didn't have no U-Haul trailers or nothing like that. Mm-mm. And Blake and Caitlin had come had came out for SQT graduation. So the plan was that they were going to drive one truck, we were going to drive the other. No planning. We 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 did no planning on this drive. No, nope, we put but, it in the GPS and left. Yeah, literally just piled everything that we had, which wasn't much. It was enough to fill up both those trucks though. Yeah. And uh just put our dress off of two seventy eight is where I was living at the time. Yep. In uh Dallas, Georgia. Rock Mart, Dallas, and and we uh just took off down the road, man. Like it like it was like it won't nothing to it. I cannot believe how long you just made talking about just getting ready for the trip. How well, did, you that? do understand the purpose of a podcast is to talk and tell stories, right? We got a lot to talk about, though. Well, like, we can stop when we want. We but got, we got a lot. This is a recount. This is a historical recount of these <laughs> events that our children can listen to one day. And the make and model of the truck, and where we bought the truck, and who we bought it from, and its long term future so is relevant. If Brooke, if Brooke was in charge of the podcast, this is what the episode would be. Yep, we drove. To, we drove back to Georgia. Had a hard time. No, no, broke no. up. Nope, baby, you you just told him. <laughs> You just told them. No, I stop at the relevant details. I stop. I would stop about like why? Why were we fighting? What was going on? I don't stop and tell you about the freaking history of our truck we had. Like, well, your your podcast would be different than my podcast. This belongs to both of us. Okay. Well, it, and I tried to get you to start, and you were like. I started. Your energy's throwing me off. I don't know what to say. I started, and then you freaking went on a hem hall rant about. So, what would you like to say now? So, I would like to talk about the drive. Okay. So, on the drive, we just started bickering. I don't remember anything about what it was. Do you? I think we were both just crazy. Yeah, that's legit. I remember the only thing I do remember is, like you said, everything we had was in the bed. And we had a tarp, and the tarp had, like, folded over on itself and was exposing half of the stuff in the bed. And it was pouring rain. And all of my clothes that I owned were in the bed of that truck. And I was like, babe, pull over so I can pull this tarp back over so my clothes don't get soaking wet. And you wouldn't pull over. You know, that's crazy because I remember that, too. Do you remember that? I can't believe that. I remember being so angry. Like, I don't know if I was screaming or what was happening. But that's my only, I remember that. And I remember crossing some salt flats. And we were fighting about something. And you turned and looked at me and you're like, I wish Blake was in this truck with me and not you. And that that's the only two things I remember from that trip. Other than just, oh, and us eating at Cracker Barrel. I remember that. And didn't we get turned around somewhere in Texas? And we almost ran out of gas. Yeah. Yeah. That was the craziest place, man. Mm-hmm. So we took I-20. We took I-20 across Texas. So we took the southern route. Um, Well, you know, there's Bissick's description of the drive. No. Pretty I, interesting. And No, stop. Sorry. So don't tell them about what hotel we stayed at and the history of it and where all we went to eat every day. And But, like, what was that, what was that drive like for you? Well... For me, so I don't think that, I don't think that even I fully comprehend or, or in most especially anybody else fully comprehends like the transformation that, that I had went through over the, over the last year. That's legit. So when I say 
we were crazy. I guess I shouldn't say Brooke was. I don't know what was going through Brooke's head. Oh, I was crazy. But for me, I had went through this transformation through the whole SEAL training pipeline to the point that, dude, I, I was, I, I don't even know. I was, I was extremely, uh, I don't know if you want to say violent or not like me, like I wouldn't like abuse Brooke or anybody else, but just like may, or, or maybe it's that just like I had become so committed to my, my job and my career as a SEAL. Like I wasn't really committed to you or my family or really anybody. I didn't really care. I just wanted to be left alone to go to my SEAL team and do my job there. Yeah. I didn't really want anybody to be with me. You know, I was just, you know, they, I like I say, you can't understand how much that training pipeline warps your mind. I mean, you're literally an undeveloped brain, and you're you're you find yourself, you know, sitting in a classroom watching. They force you to watch videos of people getting their heads cut off and tell you that's who you're about to go and fight these people and and just that like breeding that anger and hatred into you, which is necessary. I'm not complaining. Mm -hmm. It's it's necessary. But it even still affects me today. Um, but that was really early on in, in that transformation that I experienced. And I don't even think I knew how to handle it. I don't think I really knew who I was or how to channel it or how to handle it or anything like that. So, yeah, we we were just fussing and arguing. And like I say, I wasn't, I didn't, I don't feel like I was really committed to you. I just, that was it. Um, I knew we had to make it to Georgia, and I was going to get some time off. And that that's really all that I remember about the drive, I guess. I, I, yeah, I remember it being a miserable, very miserable, miserable time. Which is sad, because it could have been really cool. Oh, it could have been awesome. Yeah, and we, I also remember fighting with you because me and Blake and Caitlin, this is how I remember it, we wanted to stop. And, like, see a few things and do things. And, like you said, all you wanted to do was get home. Like, you would yeah. not stop. And, yeah. So, we get back. And I was just trying to recall how we separated. Like, I don't remember. I don't. Was it something we decided in the car? Do you remember? No, I can't remember. I don't, I don't think it was. I don't think it was on the drive. It was once we were home. I think it was, yeah. So I remember the Martin's Biscuit story, but that was like the day before you were supposed to leave. So yeah. I'm pretty sure we broke up soon after we arrived in Georgia because I know there was a time there where I was like, what do I do? Like He's still home. He's going to leave soon. Oh, man, that's it's so hard to talk to. The, this is why I, my energy was off during this beginning of this episode this is very hard time for me to talk about really oh man it's so hard weird boo oh yeah it's not a big deal we were both kids i know but it was a very <laughs> very turbulent time in my life yeah so neither of us remember the exact events so we can't give them to you but we decided probably out of anger that we were going to break up. And here I had left my pit, not any job I had, but I had, you know, left everything, went to San, San Diego, and now Chad's about to head to Virginia, and now I'm dropped back at my parents' house. Yep. And I got nothing. I had sold my truck. I gave you that S10 to drive around. Hold on. Yeah, tell about that. You gave me the S10. I had it for about a about two weeks because I had I had just gotten a job. It only took me about a week or so to get a new job. And 
your mom showed up at the house because you said you, I could have the S10 until I started working and got enough money to buy another truck. And your mom sh- and dad showed up at the house and said, we need to take the truck. And I was like, holy crap, like I don't have a vehicle. Um, he said we could wait until I got up some money and then you, he would take it back. And your mom was, it was bad. Like Your mom felt terrible. I was legitimate. This is why it's such a hard time to talk about. This was before I knew Jesus. This was before I really had zero guidance, zero mentors outside of SEAL people, mm-hmm. community. And I was genuinely a terrible person. Like, my heart had gotten so freaking hard against everything. I mean, I, I look back on it, I'm like, how could I do that to you? It, and, and I know, I know we were young, yeah. but still, to think, I was still respond. I was like, I was still, I was old enough to be accountable for those actions. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I know we were fussing, and you weren't perfect either. No, heck no. You know, but. No, far um, from it. It's like, there's no other way to put it other than I was just a hard, like, when I say a hard-hearted person, I'm talking about, like, bad. Oh, you would. When we would be driving down the road, you would pick out people walking down the street and be like, I bet he's a so-and-so effing piece of crap. He's probably nothing. And you would just start in on somebody, like, out in public. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, I, rough. Rough as a cob, son. But like you said, I was too. I mean, as soon as we got back home and me and you broke up, I was straight to my dealer. I mean, like, I, don't, I think it was that day. I was like, okay. Yeah. We're going to yeah. do this again. We were sick. We were. We were sick people. Yeah. Really. I mean, that's why it's, it's a, that my worst time of my whole life, my entire life, the worst time, 100% is the year plus that me and Brooke spent apart from each other. Well, and and part of that was was us being apart but part of it was what all you were going through and these huge life adjustments and like you said trying to learn how to cope with all this new stress but also perform at your job like it wasn't just the breakup that made it like that don't you think it was a culmination of factors no i don't think so you think it was just being being away from each other i, I think yeah i think that was i, think I that mean was i was miserable i I picked up, because when we moved to San Diego, I got clean, because I didn't have a choice, and then when we came back, I was deep, quick. Like, I started working at a Tilted Kilt. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, when I got back. I was working at a Mexican restaurant in Tilted Kilt, and I was meeting all of these really not good people, and just doing bad stuff for money, and just... It was bad. Like, I was down hard. I was down hard, too. Yeah. Yeah. So, But, but the when when we, before I left the house. You turned on Martin's Biscuit? Yeah, to go up to the <laughs> the um, the SEAL team in Virginia Beach. The morning you were leaving. Yeah, it was the like morning I was leaving. The whole, and the whole time I was home, I don't freaking know what I was doing. Probably just. Partying. Drinking and yes. hanging out with Brandon Price. Exactly. And, you know, my old buddies and this and that. Just empty, man. Gosh, man. I forget how low I've been in life because life is so good now. Mm-hmm. Forget how low. And uh, then, yeah, it's like the day before I was supposed to leave. What? So you tell me that from your perspective. So I had been texting you and calling you knowing that you were about to leave. And I don't remember, what, like, if you responded or what, but I knew the morning you were leaving, and I stopped, and you used to, like, on the way to your house, there was a Martin's, and I used to stop and get you a, 
an egg and tenderloin biscuit. And I got you one as an excuse to drive 45 minutes to your house and bring you the biscuit. Because otherwise I would just be showing up, you know, which is stupid. So I came early in the morning to catch you. And I remember, I think I let myself in. And I went upstairs and you and Brandon were like hungover, most definitely. And I, I met you in your room and I handed you that biscuit. And I, I don't remember what you said, but I knew that you didn't, you weren't taking me with you. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I knew, I don't, do you remember anything? I don't remember what you said. I mean. I just remember leaving. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I just, I think I just was so hard hearted. I didn't. You were cold. Yeah. I just didn't care about life or anything. You were cold. I mean, this thank thank Jesus that He forgives me for all this stuff. I couldn't live I couldn't live with the way I used to act if it wasn't to, if if I didn't know that I've been covered by the blood of Christ. Just awful. Hmm. You think you're bad. <laughs> well, it just Oh my gosh. For for me it's it's not it's not the drinking and the partying and the the sleeping around and and all that. That's not it. That's not the part that eats me up. It's the way that I treated the people that I loved and that loved me, and the people that were committed to me. You know, it's the it's the heart problem. Like not the cyst. We're not going back. Like the 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 heart. Of me, my soul, just how, just how filthy and terrible it was. You know, that's what bothers me. I can get, I can get over all the, the tangible action, actionable things, you know. Um, so, but yeah, that, that was the last time we saw each other Mm -hmm. for, Quite a long time. Really not that long, though, because I was living in my buddy's dad's house. And several times when you came home to visit, me and you would get together. But I don't I think it was a mixture of both of us didn't want to act like we missed each other. Oh, yeah. So we would act like we were just having sex. Yeah, it was a toxic, toxic. Yeah, we would. Yeah, we would. I mean, sad as it was, we would usually, you know, and then both be like, okay, see you later. Yeah. Like on purpose, you know, when I know I was dying. Like, Oh, me too, man. Yeah. Wow. And you would tell me when you were coming over to hook up and hang Mm. out, you were dating, um, I'm not going to say names, but you were dating people and you would tell me about it. And then I remember one thing. Because I always had hope. Like, during all this time, I had hope. I was like, I don't know, I just didn't give up. And then when you were dating the one person you dated, right when we were dating when I moved out, you called me and she thought she was pregnant. And when you, you called me and told me that for no reason. You oh, were this like, is hateful. Yeah, you were like, so-and-so is pregnant. Yeah. And I was like, why is he telling me this? But then I was like, okay, well, that's it. Like, he's dating this person, and it ended up not being true. Thank goodness. Yeah. Just, but, just yeah, I mean, that's just being hateful is all I was doing. So, and I want to talk about, like, what you were doing during this time and then what I was doing this, during this time. Well, then, so I left, drove up to Virginia Beach, and uh, I lived with Aaron. And Amber. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so I, li- I lived with them. Uh, I, well, the first, I, I got up there, pretty much checked in with Aaron. He had me a, a bedroom there at his house, and we checked in the SEAL team. And for literally, this the SEAL team, SEAL Team 8 was on deployment. They were toward the tail end of their deployment when we checked in. And so... We couldn't go out and deploy with them because they were getting ready to come back. 
And for about a month and a half, there was this dude named Kip. <laughs> and Kip was an old Navy warrant officer, not a SEAL, but he, he was like the admin guy at the SEAL team. So the whole SEAL team had deployed. Kip was the only guy left, and they had made Kip, he was a civilian, by the way, retired Navy. They had made him like the acting <laughs> XO, executive officer of the SEAL team. And let me tell you, old Kip took that seriously. The only, I mean, the, all he was there to do, essentially, I'm sure he was doing paperwork stuff, and all, you know, on his computer, but he was there basically just to receive us when we checked into the SEAL team and then give us something to do. So we sat for about a month and a half in a closet and wove 550 cord or paracord onto paddle handles. <laughs> a paddle like you would row a boat with. Yeah. So when you leave a command or you retire from the Navy, usually you get a paddle with a little plaque on it. It's like a little memento or whatever. And I guess a bunch of people were getting ready to retire after this deployment. So we set and twisted 550 cord on the paddle handles for a month and a half. I'd be so pissed. You think you're, all you think about is just you're about to get to go kill some folks and do some cool stuff and you end up, <laughs> you end up doing that. Yeah. It's Can you imagine me and Aaron and no. a couple other guys sitting uh -uh. in there for a month and a half? No. We and did this for like five, six hours a day, every day. And that's all, it's all Kip had for us. Um, you know, I I don't I, as far as what I was doing. Well, the Navy had given me that forty thousand dollar bonus mm -hmm. for graduating SQT. You got you. I, an I apartment. think I spent that in six months. Yeah, you got you an apartment. Well, a that Harley, was yeah a truck. Yeah, big screen. Ate out every night. Couches. Yeah. Yeah. That was after I moved out with, with Aaron. I remember being at Aaron's house one time. Where they lived was kind of in a slum in Norfolk. Mm -hmm. Norfolk ain't nothing but a slum anyways, other that, than right I, there in downtown. Their neighborhood wasn't bad, boo-boo. It was well, nice. Well, let me tell you how bad it was. I remember pulling up to Aaron's house one day, and his neighbors, it was probably six or seven guys, they were all standing out in the yard. Me and Aaron got out of that old truck he used to have and were walking up to the house, and they started making their way over to us, and um, they were going to rob us. Whoa. Like, they were they were surrounding us, and I don't know if they were going to beat us up and rob us or what their agenda was, but they were very hostile. And um, I remember Aaron... He just pulled his. He had a he had a long, longer shirt on. He just pulled it up, and he had old nineteen eleven there, and he he showed them, and uh, they changed their tune, decided to go back over to their yard. Aaron would have shot them. I'm surprised Aaron didn't shoot him. I'm just surprised for walking it, over. Oh, I know. Yeah. Um. But yeah, it was a rough place. So I got out of there, got an apartment. Yeah, and just. I just blew through. I blew through that forty thousand dollars in six months, just eating out, trying to find some happiness in life. Because through through this money, I had never had money in my whole life until then. I remember before I joined the Navy, I remember telling some people back here in Georgia, if I can get through this training. They're going to give me $40,000. <laughs> You're going to be set. <laughs> I literally thought, I didn't think anybody had that much money. Really, I, I did, other than like millionaires. Mm -hmm. And I thought, if I could get this money, I'm good for the rest of my life. <laughs> I mean, that was just an astronomical amount of money to me. Um, and And the people that I would tell that to would agree with me. They'd be like, oh, yeah, I'll do anything for $40,000. Right? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so I got, I, I and, and I, the so I just blew it. It was, it was, it was just, just an idiot. You know, I didn't find any happiness or enjoyment 
any fulfillment from anything during that time in my life. Um, and I think for me, like I say, when we were apart and like I, I was trying to find something or someone else in life that could replace you as part of my life. And I found out it took me a year and it cost me a lot of money. But I found out that I could not find anything in my life that would replace you. And you tried a lot of people. I mean, I'm not trying to dog on you because I dated a lot too. Well, I dated a lot of people. I, I you know, I, I did, I, I bought anything I wanted. Uh, mm-hmm. Like I say, man, you know, I just, that was, that was what I was searching for. You know, work was good. When I think when I was at work, when I was training, you know, with my platoon or spending time with them, I think I found some fulfillment in that. I'm sure. You yeah. know, that that was a, a pretty steep learning curve and, you know. Well, you finally made it. Like, you, you'd hit so much, so many obstacles and so much adversity trying to do this thing. And there you were. Like, you were at the team. Yeah. You were done. There was some fulfillment in that. But as soon as I left work, I had nothing. Uh, That apartment was empty. Mm -hmm. It was just a, it was rough, man. And then um, when I, when I left to go on my first deployment, I left, I I got rid of that apartment. I think I'd put everything in a storage unit somewhere. And then I came home from that deployment, and I moved in with two lesbians. And you talk about a toxic, toxic environment. On top of already how terrible I was, here now I'm moving with these two lesbians. And um, because I had nowhere to live, I had got rid of that apartment, I had to find somewhere else to live but there was some in between time there will you turn on your mic just a little bit for me i'm sorry boo boo yeah i'll turn down your headphones that'd be good let me know is that good that's perfect All thank right, you sweet. and um i made it through that and then found i think shortly after that i found the the uh the coon shack mm-hmm. or what do we call that corn crew the corn crib, yeah. I found the corn crib. It was a little old, uh, it was a little 500 square foot shack back behind this guy's house that he rented out. And um, you're number two, I think. Yeah. So I'd found that. I moved out, out of the house with them lesbians and moved into the <laughs> corn crib. And uh, I was I was living there right on Shore Drive, a little bit better of an area. Mm-hmm. And you had some woods and some. You had some, somewhat. I think some, I, better than an apartment. Yeah, it was better than that apartment. And it wasn't long after I moved into the corn crib that I called you, and I I, I don't know how don't, we came don't to the go, agreement. Don't, uh-uh. No, no, no. Yeah. Stop. Okay. That that's all I got to say about that time in my life. So, I was back home, and like I said earlier, after you left, it fueled my addiction 10 times more than where I was before, and I was working at Tilted Kill and on the border, and I would just work, leave work, drive all the way from Bear Parkway to Dallas to pick up drugs, and I was, when I was working at Tilted Kill, I would do like... I found, like, sugar daddies. I wouldn't sleep with them, but it was dangerous what I was doing. Like, I'm really lucky. Like, I had a few things happen that just, I'm just lucky. And I got to the point that I'd I. would say we're both lucky. We are very Or lucky. blessed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we were. We definitely. God had. somehow, so for some reason, decided to preserve us for this time of our life. <laughs> it's crazy, man. And. 
during all that time, I mean, I quickly got to the point where if I didn't have drugs, I was withdrawing. So that pushed me into stealing, breaking in, just doing terrible stuff to family and friends. And it was bad. And and so that leads me to, I'm trying to think if there's any good stories. This, I don't know. I'm I'm not comfortable yet. Like, I'm just not to a point where I can tell like specific stories. Well, I, I just, obviously, obviously, a, a lot of a lot of that stuff there. There, you know, there's not a lot of value in it. You know, I, I think it's 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 sufficient to say this is who we this is who we were. Let us be honest with you. Mm-hmm. And the, the the reason to say that and to even tell you guys about this part of our lives is to show you you can be that. If you are that right now, you can become, you can break free mm-hmm. from that. And you can be forgiven and you can find and experience the fullness of life mm-hmm. in Jesus. And, and, um, you know, there's a ton of stories that I could tell from that year of my life that are just slap shameful, Mm -hmm. you know, but why? Like, what's the point in it? Um, I feel like it would, I don't think anyone would benefit from it, but I think it would help the story because people, like some of the stories I would tell, I don't think that people understand how dark my life and your life was. You know, I don't know about yours, but I don't I don't I just don't think that the little bit of explaining I've done really Well, I I think the darkness that I had in my life was was very internal. The darkness that was in me didn't show forth as visibly as it did in your life mm-hmm. only because I had to perform at a high level as a seal. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So yeah. I, I think the, the darkness that, that was, that was in us was similar. Mm-hmm. It was just, you had m- more opportunity to have an outward expression of it yeah. because there was really nothing. People saw it, th- yeah. Yeah, but there was nothing. There was no reason in your life. Not to, yeah. you know, it wasn't like, like I had to go to the team every morning and show up and I had to PT, I had to shoot, I had to move, communicate, I had to think, I had to do all this stuff. Now, obviously I could have just said, screw all that, but it was the only thing in my life where I was finding any fulfillment. So I wasn't going to throw that away. Mm-hmm. So I think that helped, you know, that helped that darkness in me not shine it shine forth so visibly in my through my actions because I could you know if I got a DUI I was done yeah if I did drugs I was done Mm -hmm. you know so you know I I think that's the only difference is really or or a big difference you know what I mean yeah and I don't think it's fair to compare our lives at that time I think it was we were both in a bad place but I think it was totally different yeah like I don't think you can compare where we were both at I don't but yeah I I mean I should have ended up in jail like there was a couple times that I had to hide drugs from police and there's just a lot of close calls where I definitely should not have been here but I wanted to tell you were talking earlier about when you lived in Chesapeake when you blew your bonus and I remember coming to visit you there and I remember I was definitely in active addiction. I brought all my drugs with me. And I had brought um, a drug called Suboxone in case I ran out. That way I wouldn't have to withdraw. Yeah. And I actually didn't. I've never talked to you about this, but I didn't run out. But I had this weird, bad stomach pain thing while you were at work. Like, put me down. I don't. I still don't know what it was. And, um, it, I remember calling you, telling you need to come home and then it didn't go away. So you took me to the hospital. And then when we were at the hospital, 
you were looking through my wallet for my ID and you found drugs. Yeah. Do you remember that? Oh yeah, cuz I and yeah, that's a that's a and that's a detail that I didn't even think about. During that whole year, I didn't know that you were doing drugs. Yeah. I yeah. didn't know what you, I didn't know, really know what you had going on in your personal life. Yeah. I mean, when you were around me, you hit it very well. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So. So that was a shock for me. Yeah. And I remember you found that when we got back from the hospital, you confronted me. I don't remember what I told you. I don't remember if I made something up or said, I, I think I said I was selling it. I think that's what I told you, is that I was selling it because I needed money. And then somebody texted me and said, do you have any rocks? And I remember you had my phone, and you lost it. Like, you threw my phone against the wall, and you were screaming at me. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because you realized, like, I think you realized at that moment. Yeah, it's a crazy, crazy place to be in when... You're separated from the person that you love the most in the world. Because, like, I through, through all that time apart and all the terrible things that I did, I never stopped loving Brooke. And the, the anger was partly at myself for, like, me thinking I have failed you. You know what I mean? Because I still loved you. And to know that you are finally come to the, I guess, very surface level realization that you were involved in drugs and being like, you know, she's living that, she's living that life. I, I know that's a dangerous life. It's a bad life to live. But then to partly know that Maybe not know, but to partly feel like that's some of that's my fault for abandoning you. But none of it was. But none of it was. Yeah. yeah. But but you know that's that's yeah, I was angry at I was angry at myself. I was scared for you. You know, and and like, how could you be doing this? Mm-hmm. You know, didn't know anything about addiction. And by the way, for you guys that are listening to this that are former addicts. None of this is a surprise to you. I I think a lot of former addicts will understand our story and understand these situations. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, and the feelings. Because it's it's always crazy when we get to interact with other people in recovery. It's always crazy to hear how similar the stories are. Mm -hmm. Everything from... And the behavior. The actions, the behavior, the relationships. It's a symptom of a disease. That's, exactly. that's how you know it's a disease, is the symptoms are the same, mostly the same for everyone. It's crazy, man. But yeah, so that specific time was the only thing I remember during that year, other than, like we talked about earlier, the times that you would come home to visit, and you would call me, and we would hook up, and then that was it. And then I want to remember why you invited me to come visit in Virginia, because we had that bad visit in In Chesapeake, where you found the drugs. Yeah. And you were really angry with me. And you kind of acted like you didn't want to see me anymore. You were like, I don't, I just remember. I I think I just, I think I, it took me that long to kind of finally come to the realization that uh, no matter what she's doing, like, no matter who she's become, whatever's happened over this last year, like, I don't even care because I can't replace her. I can't replace you in my life. And, like, coming to the realization and and even thinking back then, thinking, you know, how much longer can I wait on this before she finds somebody else that, you know, she falls in love with and then she's gone? Which, really, probably the greatest threat was at that time was you losing your life Absolutely. to to but addiction. But you didn't know. But that. I didn't know that. Yeah. I didn't know how bad that was. But you still thought I might have just had a bad little run. Yeah, you know, exactly. You didn't know I was an. You didn't know I was addicted. 
And even if I would have known, I wouldn't know known what that. I, I would have thought, well, I can just lock her in the bedroom for a week and yeah. she'll be fine when yeah. she comes out. <laughs> you know what I yeah. mean? Uh, that was my thoughts around that. Yeah. But um, but yeah, I think it was just it, it took about a year plus mm -hmm. for me to finally just say I I can't all right I I can't find nobody else to replace her in my life. Well, and so this you're kind of saying all of the story like. You invited me to come visit, so I flew into Virginia, and I visited, and it was in March of 2012, and I had been dating. No, it wasn't 2012. Yes, it was. There ain't no way. Baby, we got married. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah, it wasn't 2012. No, it was 2012. Yes, it was. Well, that's an irrelevant detail, but because I got saved in 2012. That's the year we got married. I was using. You were not. Well, it's that's irrelevant. That's that's the year we got Jada. Okay. Continue. I'm sorry. Okay, it's okay. So maybe it wasn't. Regardless, I guess you said it's irrelevant, but. I came out to visit. You just invited me up for a few days. And I flew in, and you picked me up, and we hung out. And then during that visit, I told you that I was dating somebody. And I had found a guy back in Georgia that I actually kind of liked. He he didn't even come close to you. But he was the first guy that I didn't absolutely hate being around. Because, like, I was in the same boat. I couldn't. I was trying to replace you, and it wasn't happening. Um. And I told you about that guy, and I, you asked what I was doing for my birthday because it was coming up the next month. And I said, well, this guy's taking me to Gatlinburg. He had planned some kind of fancy trip for us. And I said, we're going here. And I remember you getting really, you know where we were sitting? We were sitting on the back porch looking out. And I remember you getting really quiet. And sometime between then and when I went to leave, you asked me to come stay with you. You were like, I'm ready. You need to you need to move, move in. And I remember I didn't give you an answer during that trip. I went oh, home. Oh, you played me. I didn't know what to do. I mean, you had been, we had just been like hookup buddies for so long. I was like, is this real or is this, you know, what is this? And there was also the thing of, I was going to have to give up my drug dealer and the network I had built, you know, in Dallas. Yeah. And I was going to have to probably go through withdrawals and be really sick. Yeah. And so that was scary. You know, that was a big thing for me. But you made the right decision. I did. I packed up my, my Dodge 1500. The transmission was slipping so bad before I drove up to you. That sometimes when I would be pulling out from a stop sign, the transmission would just completely slip out of gear. And oh, I'd no. have to turn it on and back off while I was rolling. And that truck lasted for years <laughs> after that. <laughs> it did. I just was like, okay, I'm going to try to drive this thing to Virginia. But yeah, so. And you got lost somewhere in Norfolk. And cried. I was so tired. Yeah, you lost it. I don't, why didn't I just drive up there and... The, the well, we didn't have GPSs on our phones or anything. I was back using then. MapQuest. Yeah, yeah, I was using a MapQuest, and oh no, I had a little GPS. You Dad, had one of the little Tom Toms, exactly. But it it was routing you some weird no, no, way no. in the downtown. You Norfolk. know what it was? The Norfolk, the tunnel in Norfolk was closed. Oh, okay. And I had I'd never even seen a freaking tunnel that went underwater, so I was like, "What is happening?" And I just remember like the Tom Tom or whatever, whatever. But yeah. I got lost. And then when I got there, I remember you greeted me. I was exhausted because I didn't sleep the night before. And you had bought us two kayaks, and you were so excited Oh yeah, about getting to show yeah. me these kayaks you had bought for us. And you wanted to take them out to the bay. Yep. And, yeah, and that was the start. Yeah, you showed up, and you were wore out. I was so tired. Had you a few boxes in the back of that truck, packed full of clothes. Yeah. Man. Yep. I think we did take the kayaks out for a few minutes, but you just did it to make me happy. Yeah, we did. Yep. Lord of mercy, son. 
Well, y'all just got to hear about the absolute, hands down, 100% worst year of my entire life. <laughs> Literally from the time I was born up until <laughs> now that now I'm living. That was a rough one. Um. So, yeah, you know, you move back in. Um. And do you want to go on from there? Or? Yeah, yeah, I think we should. All right, we're back. Um, I don't know. I don't know how much <clears throat> further we can go through this story because I do have to sleep tonight. And like I say, it's it's really really tough for me to talk about these days, uh, these times because see, when Brooke moves back in with me in Virginia. I would say things for me got better because you were back, but things did not get easier. No. I mean, it, from my perspective, it would have gotten worse for you. No, it didn't because you were there and I had, I could at least know that you were in a safe place. Yeah. Or, or the, at least I could know you had a safe place to come home to. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Well, yeah. I mean, I wasn't out on the streets doing stuff there. And somebody, ha you, you, ha you know, I could at least protect you yeah. from bad people. Yeah. So that meant a lot to me. That's why I say it did get better for me emotionally. Yeah. But things did not get easier. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I thought... I could have swore it was quite a while from the time you moved back in with me in, there in the corn crib to the time we got married. I see my timeline is, and we don't need to spend a whole lot of time on this, but I thought I moved in in 2012 and we got married in October of 2012. I thought I moved in in April. We got married in October. I don't know. I, I can't. We got Jada in May. Lord, Leonard, <laughs> Leonard, <laughs> Leonard is snorting into the microphone. I'll, I'll, have, I'll have to look back at some of my documents and stuff to get what the... What do you mean documents? Well, like, I, like I, I remember some of the schools I went to and stuff like I have okay. in, in my little binder I have in there of all my... It, it's it's They called it in the Navy, your I love me book. And Gosh. it's where you kept every all, all your certificates. I, I've been to so many dang schools. I went to so many. I, I've got a whole binder of graduation certificates from breacher school, armor school, comm school. Uh, you know, jump every, everything. everything. All, I mean, everything. It's 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 like a it's like two college degrees packed into it. Mm -hmm. Two years of training. Because that, I could look back through those and and kind of nail the timeline down a little bit but it was anyways at a minimum months that we lived together before we got married see i'm i'm pretty sure i'm right and if i'm right it was yeah five or six months and during that time i remember i had brought a little bit with me to taper off and my withdrawals weren't too bad and then i wasn't there for a week and you left and that was my reality. Like, I was with you, but you were never home. Yeah, all I provided was a safe place for you to live. Yeah. I, I wasn't home. I, no, you were never home. Like, and I'm talking about gone like 300-something days out of the year. Like, yeah, and when I was home, I was prepping gear to leave again. Or you guys, yeah, because I moved out during a workup, I think. Yeah, you, you, yeah, yeah. you did. Yeah, so I knew nobody. I knew nothing about Virginia Beach. I had no friends. I met Paul and Dave. <laughs> I started yeah. my first friends. Which were good people. They were good people. I Good-hearted people. Yeah. I would go down to the beach every day and fish. This was, I, this was before I had a job, I think. I would go to the jetty, and I would fish, and I would catch trout and red drum and puppy drum, and I loved it. And these two old dudes were always out there, Paul and Dave. And Paul was British, and Dave was from Virginia Beach, and they were just old redneck guys. And we just made friends, and they ended up being 
both of our friends for a long time. Paul, yeah. Paul texted me today. But I'll be dying. I know. Surprised he's still alive. Me too. Um, but all that, to, I just pulled a you, boo boo. No, I was, did I mean, you hear that's me? Just, that's great. I like to hear you talk. So I kind of wallowed in that loneliness. And instead of going out and making friends, like I got a job, um, but I turned to drugs again. Yeah. And to get drugs, I didn't know anybody and I wasn't going to go to Norfolk. And so I went to a doctor and complained about pain that didn't exist. Yeah. And that's how I started getting drugs. So I started doctor shopping is what it's called. Yeah. I would go to a bunch of different doctors and try to get the highest level of pain medication or anxiety medication I could get. And I would get multiple prescriptions. And this was before they were monitoring it. Now That that was really common back then. Yeah. Thank yeah. God they're monitoring it now. Um, you can't do that anymore. But so, and I remember the first time you kind of found out, I don't, you may not remember this. We haven't talked about any of this, so it's really weird to like discuss it, but. Yeah. Why talk about it? <laughs> no, I mean, I think it's interesting. No, I'm saying in, in oh. just day to day conversation. Oh, yeah. Like, remember that time I found them drugs? No, no. Yeah. No. <laughs> you know what I mean? No. Yeah. I don't know we, why. We actually have good things to talk about these days yeah yeah jeremy our therapist will probably make us talk about it one day oh my lord um but we had gone to the beach and we were on chick's beach and i was driving my dodge still and i had got a prescription and i had put it behind the seat my driver's seat of my dodge i had like hid it in some kind of crack or crevice back there and i remember we were on the beach, and we were missing something. I don't know what it was. Like, so, Do you remember this? Vaguely. Yeah, m- we were missing sunscreen or water or something. So you were going to go back and get it. And you were gone for a really long time. And it didn't cross my mind, but somehow you had caught on and you had found those drugs. And when you found them, I went into this explaining of like, I was having chronic pain issues. Yeah. And this is what I needed to get by. And I honestly, this is going to sound so crazy, y'all, but I think I had convinced myself that I had pain issues. You had to have because you had surgery. I know. I know. I don't. Oh, oh, I hate talking about it. It I hate hate talking about it. It's hard. Oh, I hate it. (laughs) Oh. It's just so crazy. But. Well, hey, you're covered by the blood, just like me. All of this is forgiven. That's the most beautiful thing about Christ. The most beautiful thing about Christ is you no longer have to have shame. If you have faith, just the ounce of a mustard seed. Which is my faith. That's and that, That's all you need. This is the most beautiful thing. And this is why, if you haven't already figured this out, why I love Jesus so much. It it ain't it it this is it. All that's covered. It's cast into the sea of forgetfulness. And we are whiter than snow now. Praise God. I don't mean to preach a sermon on you. You I'm bet just, you this is your second sermon you uh, bust I, it in on. Well, this conversation makes me appreciate the forgiveness that my Creator offers to me on a whole nother level. It makes me value forgiveness on a whole nother level. It makes me value that, but it also makes me value your forgiveness when I talk about this. Well, the only way, the only way that I could forgive you is by is by Jesus coming into my heart and him teaching me and showing me how to forgive and his own word tells me if you don't forgive I don't forgive you yeah and and now we're talking about how much I value the forgiveness that he offers to me and how much I I need and want access to that 
Well, when I read that for the first time, when I got saved on deployment. Let's, yeah, and yeah, don't, don't, we gotta I, get Yeah, there. I won't, I won't go to that, but, you know, that, that's what I'm talking about. That, that, I, I don't get any credit for that forgiveness. Because if I would have been the old me, I would have hated you and left you. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think you thought about it a few times. <laughs> well, it got, it got hard yeah. enduring and, it. Le- and if you'll stop preaching, we can get there. Okay. We can get there. So, and I think, I mean, I'm seeing you looking at your phone, and you've looked at that. No, Blake just sent me a text. Oh. I was making sure he didn't want to do that bike ride in the morning. He said he was going to stay around the house. Okay. I think it would be good, and you tell me what you think as based on how tired you are. I think it would be good to build up to at least that deployment or yeah, that's fine. rehab and then stop. Yeah, we can just we can just build up to that, uh, well, wherever we want to stop. Okay. That's fine. So do you remember, you don't remember really that, like finding those in the me telling you? I do vaguely, yeah. Yeah, I do. I do vaguely, but yeah. And then you, you know, you obviously saying, well, I have, this is, I'm not, I'm not addicted. It's just, just, I have this problem. Right. Manipulating you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 And so that continued and just like any addiction, it's progressive. So it just got worse and worse. And you were gone. Um, and I'm trying to think of anything significant in between that time. Um, there was one good thing that came out of the surgery you had. What? I got to miss dive training. Oh, gosh. Oh. <laughs> but that was late. I mean, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, I had, I was so convinced or desperate. I don't know which one it was. I don't know if I was so convinced that I had the pain or I was willing to get surgery to continue my supply of drugs. And I honestly think it was the latter. Like, that's really shameful to say. It's a testament to the power of that but, disease. Yeah, I it think really it was. Is. They were, yeah, they were doing an exploratory surgery to see if they could figure out why I was having this chronic pain. And didn't find anything. And then it just continued. And and the whole time, the whole time this is going on, I, I am now legitimately convinced that you have a, a chronic he- debilitating health problem. Mm-hmm. So like, which, uh, which you did, it's called addiction. Mm-hmm. I was just thinking it was stomach pain. You know what I mean? So, I'm worried about you. I'm trying to still do my job as a SEAL. We're getting ready to deploy. And, yeah, it just, um, when when I deployed, we, we got married, mm-hmm. right? We, and essentially, we got married so you could have access to health care mm-hmm. is, is, was the foundation of why we decided to go ahead and get married before I left and went on deployment. And a lot of it too, I remember talking about like convenience, like a couple of times you needed me to pick you up on base. That's true. Yeah. And like, uh, when you arrived home from deployments, I couldn't get at NOB to pick you up from the airport. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, I know that the healthcare was a big one, but there was also other reasons that we were like, this is stupid for us not to get married. That is true. Yeah. And you got extra money. Yeah, we didn't get married for, for our um, our moral or ethical beliefs at all. We got married because we thought it was a convenient thing to do. Well, and I, I like me at the time when we were talking about getting married, I thought I was going to be with you for forever. Like there was no doubt in my mind that our marriage was going to last, and like I, I thought I definitely had feelings like we were rushing it. But I wasn't concerned about, or divorce wasn't like something. I was, I wasn't thinking. Well, when this doesn't work out, you know, I don't know what you were thinking, but I was in it. Oh yeah, no, I wasn't thinking about it either. I mean, that, like I say, that year that we spent apart, it convinced me. Yeah. That, yeah, we were going. We there's just there really was no other choice. Yeah. But for us to be together, um. So we got married. I went on. My, my, 
I guess my second long deployment. Mm -hmm. Um, and while I was on that deployment was when I got saved. Now I won't go through that whole story. I've told that story other places. I would like to tell my side of that story when you get done. Yeah, no. Um, I, essentially, I was living in this place on this deployment that was inhabited or infested by a demon. The, um, with, without trying to sugarcoat it, that's what it was. And uh, the things that happened in there were freaky as crap. And then, and then <laughs> that, and then I called Blake. Blake put me in touch with his pastor. His pastor prayed over this place. It fixed the problem. And I said, "Oh wow." I need to look at this Bible here, mm-hmm. see what this is all about, because this actually was legit. Mm-hmm. And um, and when I got saved on that deployment, literally, I was. I when 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 the when the Christian folk <laughs> that you know say, "Do you want to be born again?" I understand that statement. Now, it sounds really corny to everybody else. Not everybody else. A lot of you guys can also understand that statement because you had a similar experience to me when when you got saved by Jesus. And now, I literally woke up the next morning, and it was like I was a new creation. I was literally born again to the point that my entire life changed. Mm-hmm. It, Everything about me changed. My thought process, my my speech, my thoughts, um, my desires, everything. And I, I carried on through the through the rest of that deployment. Things kept happening. Legitimate things that were setting my faith in concrete. And, and I, I can only imagine that this was God preparing me for what I was about to face when I returned home. I've never heard you say that. It's really, yeah, that's crazy. You can tell your side of it now. Yeah, I was, you were gone and we Skyped. I mean, I wasn't allowed to know where you were. So I had no clue where you were, but we Skyped and you, you had told me about the weird stuff happening in that barracks and that you and the other guys were sleeping in the room together instead of your separate rooms. Y'all were all in one room together. Cause you said, screw this. And, uh, you just, you just Skyped me and you, I don't remember what you said. I just remember being like kind of like surprised and I didn't really know how to react to the fact that you were so excited that you were a Christian. And you, in in regular Chad fashion, like hit the ground running 120% vested into the Bible and Jesus. And you immediately wanted us to start doing Bible studies together. And you immediately started praying for me and praying for you and... Like it was, like you said, it was like overnight. And I remember, I remember being kind of angry in a way because you were telling me I couldn't cuss anymore. Um, You were telling me I couldn't watch certain things. It's funny how I just expected you to get it. Yeah. (laughs) Like, oh, you better get on board with this. (laughs) Yeah, you were, but I didn't care. I mean, I was so in love with you. I didn't, I would do anything that, you know, I, I would do anything to make you happy and, And I knew it was a good thing, even though I was frustrated that, like, you were saying our lives were going to change completely, and I didn't like a lot of it. Like, I knew. I can hear that through the mic. Is that why you keep kicking me? Yeah. I I knew that it was a good thing. So, I don't know what else I was going to say. So, yeah, but that was when we started doing weekly Bible studies with your family. Do you remember that? We did it for a very short time. We would all get together on Zoom. Skype. Skype, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. And do a Bible study. Yeah. But, no, I mean, I don't don't know how to properly, like, stress 
that you quite literally were a totally different person overnight. Like it was the weirdest thing. And I was already dealing with worrying about you coming back as a different person because of what was going to happen on deployment. That was one of my worst fears. Every time I saw, every time I said bye to you, I was like scared you were going to die. And I was scared you were going to have to kill somebody or do something terrible and it was going to affect you. And I was, you know, you were going to come back different. Yeah. Um, But you came back different. You just came back different in a way I didn't expect, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, um, that, that was, and, and this is, this is something for me that people say, how do you know your faith is real? How do you know God's real? Well, you know, uh, y'all don't know me like Brooke knows me, but I have went in and out of being passionate about things mm-hmm. all of my life. Uh, I'll get, I'll get really fired up about something. I'll get it figured out, or I won't get it figured out, and then no, I just... No, you figure it out. Yeah, I'll figure it out. You always figure it out. And, and then I just, I drop it, and I move on to something else. Mm-hmm. My whole life, that that's how I've been. Your mom's the same way. Yeah. And this Jesus, and this book that is the Bible, is the only thing mm-hmm. that I know of in my whole life that has stuck with me and i'm st- i'm more passionate about it today than i was back then i to me uh, i mean you ask me how it's how it's real it's the only thing in my life that has stayed with me and stuck and and it's because it changed me in such a real way. And that's the best way I know how to explain it to you. I, you know, anyways, <laughs> when, when when I and then so when I got home from that deployment, you had got your your addiction had gotten so bad. That it, it couldn't really be, uh, the way I remember it, it couldn't really be swept under the rug anymore. I remember it getting to that point when you were going back and forth to Fort Chaffee. I don't remember when that was, but I remember that was when I started taking new drugs on top of the drugs I had been consistently taking, and they made me fall asleep while I was driving. Mm-hmm. They made me like I couldn't I couldn't talk right. I was slurring and I would I mean I was just Well, I remember, yeah, I remember a couple times. I don't know if it was while I was on deployment or while I was going on a training trip, but like not being able to get a hold of you for a whole day mm-hmm. or day and a half and it's cuz you'd be in the bed basically passed out. Mm-hmm. And so th- this is when it all came to a head. Yeah, well, like, and I don't know your perspective, but what I felt like when you were going back and forth, I hated when you you loved Fort Chaffee. It was a it was a training place he went, but you would work four weeks there, one week back, four weeks there, one week back. Yeah, and it destroyed me, like the whole because people don't understand like. You have to develop your own routine and your own patterns and stuff, using or not. Like I had, I worked a little bit. And when you were doing that, it's just this yo yo of like, by the time that week he was there, by the time I got used to him being around, it was time for you to go again. And it was just terrible. And I'm not, there was a million other things fueling my addiction, but I remember those being really hard days. Yeah. Um, and I remember, like you said, getting to the point that um, I was mixing things that I sh- I was mixing things that I saw people die from mixing. Yeah, like what the crap? But I knew, but I knew that I was in a bad place, and I knew I was risking my life. Like I wasn't ignorant to that. Yeah, 
Um, I just didn't care for a while. And then I'm trying to think if there's anything significant between that time and then when I came to you and asked for help. Is there anything you can think of? Or for you, was there any? Uh, I mean, I, I don't know about significant. I mean, I remember many a nights, well, like many a days, working a hard day at the team, coming home, and during these times, you would sleep all day, mm-hmm. and then you would stay up all night. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'd come home, you and, of course, you'd be just waking up, and then you'd want to stay up all night, and I'd feel guilty if I didn't stay up with you. I gave you crap about yeah, it. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I just remember doing crazy crap, like being like rollerblading yes, that's around, what I was gonna say. around uh, Chick's Beach at 3.30 in the morning when I had to get up and be at, at the range at 6.30 yeah. that morning mm-hmm. and riding bikes and I was so crazy. Just staying up all night long, yeah. like just trying to. I don't know if you spend want to call it. Be, spend time with you. Be yeah. a good husband. What? I, yeah. I, I don't know. <laughs> I was so nuts. There's, there's got. Oh, sorry. There's got to be people in Chick Speech that still talk about me. Like, oh yeah. I used to ride around with that leg holster showing. And my big nine millimeter on my yeah, leg. Yeah, a drop leg holster. Yeah, a drop leg holster. I used to ride my bike around busy Chicks Beach in the wee hours of the morning, and I would let Jada run loose. Yeah, she would just zigzag in people's yards and run around in the road, and I'm just like, oh. we should be dead. Especially we- Jada, man. She, she, oh man, I don't. But yeah, so it was craziness. I mean, I don't, I and at that point, like, I feel like you had to know something was off. But, well, yeah, yeah, I mean. There was the chronic illness thing. Yeah. And then the loneliness, and I'm sure I complained about, like, I'm really struggling with you being away, and like. Well, it, I, I think it was, it, it did get to a point where I knew, finally, that like, okay, oh, that's all bull crap. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And And you think that was before I told you? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Especially when you'd like, yeah, when you'd have, you know, you'd be driving and you'd just kind of start veering off the road and like you were just, you were gone, man. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I I, I knew, I knew. And, And then what, what actually prompted you to, to talk to me about your addiction and finally like, yeah. It was, so that was my birthday. Yeah, that's what I thought. 2014. My birthday, so it was April 2014. That I had been in Virginia Beach for two years. And I'm, like I said, I might be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that timeline's all right. And um, I just had a couple of those nights and days where you were away. And I would go to sleep. And our, our house was this little 400 square foot. A shack. I think it was 500. 500. And it had this ladder that you climb up to the bed. And it was a platform. Um, What would you call that, boo-boo? A loft. A loft. That's Thank why you. we called it. That's why we named it the corn crib. Yeah, that's right. So it was a loft bed. And I had Jada. And Jada was my whole world. Like, I still didn't have a whole lot of friends. And I just spent all my time alone with her. And there was two different instances where I went to sleep and I woke up, and it had been, like, almost 48 hours. And Jada had crapped all over the bed, and stuff was just disgusting, and she was pitiful. And I was like, I'm not even going to be able to keep a dog alive. Like, I'm not even going to be able to keep myself alive. Mm-hmm. And honestly... It's amazing that you had that clarity of thought, though, in that time. It is. It is. And I, I it hurt me more to do that to her and not be able to take care of her than it did, like, myself. Mm-hmm. I know that sounds freaking crazy. But she saved me from running my car off a road after rehab. Yeah. She was in the car, and but we can talk about that. Um, But she, so that happened. I knew I wasn't going to be able to keep her and take care of her, and I was probably going to end up killing myself. 
And I don't remember, I, I would give anything to remember the emotions I had when I, when I, we were out on the beach, Mm -hmm. you know, that, that entrance we always went to with the barking dogs and we were sitting down and I don't remember what I told you. I just remember saying like, I have a drug problem and I need, I need to help. Like I'm ready to be different and I don't want to do this anymore. And I don't, I don't remember what you, I don't remember hardly any of it. Well, I, I remember you telling me that. I don't remember your words, but, um, you know, it was, it's interesting to me that that's, like I say, that's really amazing that you did have that clarity of thought uh, to think, okay, I'm about to, I'm about to die if I don't stop doing this. Not, and it sounds like you didn't even care, but it's amazing that God had put this dog <laughs> In our lives to keep you alive, you know what I mean, and to give you a reason and to to give you that clarity of thought. Um, and essentially that doll was, is, I guess, essentially an answer to my prayers because I had been praying. Once it came to this point, I knew something was wrong. That somehow, some way, I don't think I knew how close to death you were. But somehow, some way, you would be able to be healed from this. And uh, yeah, you used to go, and of course, I don't cry until we start talking about the dog. Ugh. But well, she's a gift. She's a gift from God. I mean, you 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 can't. You, you, it's strange how people people. I think a lot of times expect. When you're praying for someone like me, I'm praying for someone I love, and you expect for some divine intervention to happen. The interesting thing about Jesus, the God, the creator of nature, is that he will work miracles through the natural world um, because that's the way he operates. So this dog is a miracle. Is, is that was the answer to those prayers, a hundred percent. Yeah, you know. And and when people wonder why I'm so crazy about the dogs, this is why. Yeah, like it's different. But I remember, I remember you used to go, um, walk around the house. You would make laps around the house and pray. Yeah. And I was like, he's freaking losing it. Yeah. Like he's crazy. But it seemed it really seemed like that was happening right before I decided I wanted to get help. Yeah, yeah, I was praying over the place in bed where you slept at night, and I didn't, I didn't let you see me doing that stuff. But um, yeah, I mean that's the biggest miracle I, I, I've experienced in my life. People talk about miracles. Well, if you want to call, I don't know if you can call that a miracle or divine intervention or an answer to a prayer. Yeah, because if if you know addicts, like if you know some people who have gotten clean, most of the time, which I did hit a rock bottom, but most of the time there's an overdose. You get put in jail. You get, like, there's something that takes the drugs away from you. And, like, it is... To me, I haven't heard very many stories where somebody comes to their spouse and says, I don't want to do this anymore. Mm -hmm. I need help. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm ready to be better. Um, And I didn't know that that wasn't... I thought it was going to be... I didn't think it was going to be easy, but I thought I could do it. And I ended up failing at it many times, you know. But um, I don't know. We can... Old Jay, she old Jay, she's gonna have a Jay is gonna have a special place in heaven. Oh, stop! Don't as do an that. Angel dog. I mean, God used her. You know what I mean. So she will have us when she goes away from us. She will have a special place in heaven. Very special dog. There are animals in heaven. There better be. I mean, Jesus rides a horse when he comes back. <laughs> I memorized that verse today. Well, so, that's pretty amazing. I guess now that I'm crying, we have to stop. 
<laughs> well, I think that's a good stopping point. That's an hour and a half long podcast. So, um, we appreciate y'all tuning in. And like I say, if if you can take anything from this story other than just the account of our lives, uh, for any of you guys that are listening that are experiencing terrible things, maybe even more terrible than what we absolutely experienced. There's a lot more terrible. Um, maybe you're maybe you're living some lifestyle that you you know is 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 going to kill you eventually, and you think that there's no way out of it. Uh, let me tell you right now. Get a dog. There's a way out of it. Um, and I would I would argue that now we have went from that to literally, I don't think there's another human on earth that has a better life than us. I don't think so either. I, I Now, what, what I'm telling you is there's nothing that I would change, add to, or take away from our life, our marriage, our life, our, our anything and everything that we do. Agreed. And so... And it's been like that ever since we, we got our feet on the ground and I got, you know, it was a long road, but everything has always fallen into place for us. Yeah. Always. Yeah. I mean, in just a crazy way. Yeah. And understand we didn't earn it. It wasn't, it wasn't because of our, it wasn't because we just decided we wanted to be good one day. Right. Um, it was hard. Even after the point that we just stopped, it didn't. No, it didn't just no. get easier right then. Nope, I didn't get sober immediately. Yeah, and, and you didn't. I mean, no. So it get actually gets worse in some ways before it gets better. Yeah. So, and you guys listen to that. Just understand, if you can take anything from it, take that from it. Um, never quit. Never quit, so. But don't expect, like, what we're saying about there's a lot more to come in the success story. If you're dealing with things like that, don't expect an overnight miraculous change because that's not how things oh, work. No. It for it was years for us. Years. Like, yeah. I mean, again, we'll talk about it on the next episode, but it took me years to feel happy again, mm -hmm. sober or not. I mean... You know, that was not, it wasn't better, you know, yeah. initially. Like, and I think that applies to a lot of problems and lifestyles and troubles people have. They don't want to hang in for the long haul, you know? Oh, yeah, 100%. That's what it takes. And I hope to God y'all got something out of this because, by gosh, these are not easy things to sit down here and talk about. Well, I didn't cry um, until you started talking about Jada. Well, I, I mean, good. I'm talking about for me personally. Yeah, I'm not talking hard. about you. Yeah, it's re extremely hard to to sit down and recount these things. So, if you got something out of this show, we don't have any. We're we're not running any ads on this or origin series. I don't think. So, if you did get something out of it, I, I, the only the only price that I want you to pay is share it with somebody that you that you love or care about or think could get something from it. If you didn't get anything from it, well, then you're probably not still listening. <laughs> but if you did get something from it, I would ask you to share this with somebody that needs a little hope in their life. All right? that, or, that And I'm serious about this. I'm asking you as the listener to at least pay us back. In that way. Maybe they can wait till we have the fourth and fifth episode so they can hear how awesome the ending is. Because we're still in the weeds right no, now. No, they can share this one now. And hopefully it'll lock in whoever else gets in. Whoever <laughs> listens to it. But that's 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 the payment. We we would greatly appreciate that. Yeah. Um we're gonna go. Try to wind down. I might have to eat a popsicle after this. <laughs> a Chloe's popsicle. Yeah. All right. Love you guys. Thank y'all. Enough said.